Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum's uh, February, February, yeah, it is February edition of Movie Discussion Night. Uh, tonight we're going to be, uh, oh, before I get too uh, ahead of myself, uh, I just would like to say a quick thank you to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation for their continued support and all of our free programming that we get to put on virtually. Uh, without their support, we would not be able to put on these uh, free virtual programs, not just uh, our movie discussion nights, but also our trivia nights, um, our drink and draw, our curator conversations, our book talks, all the other virtual events that we have going on. So thank you very much to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation and their executive director, Ms. Jennifer Carlson. And I'd also like to say thank you to our sponsor, Generac Power Systems. Uh, without those two entities, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing right now. Um, so we are here to talk about movies tonight. And in particular, we are here to talk about the 1976 feature length motion picture, Shout at the Devil, uh, starring Lee Marvin, one of my favorite action heroes from that time period. Also Roger Moore, uh, I hope nobody, well, we're virtually, so you can't throw things at me, but uh, he is my favorite James Bond up until Daniel Craig. Um, and I know that that is a point of contention when you start talking about James Bond, who is the best Bond out there. Um, also starring Barbara Perkins and Ian Holm, uh, who you might remember from the Lord of the Rings movies, as well as many other films. Uh, but uh, he had a quite a unique role in this film. And also Reinhardt Kold, I'm going to mess this up. Reinhard Koldehoff, uh, who played Fleischer in this film. Um, this film was directed by Peter Hunt. Uh, not a huge uh, filmography for Peter Hunt, although he was instrumental in many of the 60s and 70s James Bond movies, Dr. No from Russia with Love, Goldfinger, Thunderball. Uh, and he also produced or uh, directed the 1960 feature film Sink to Bismarck, which is uh, another great film if you haven't seen that one yet. Uh, maybe I'll throw that in the mix for 2023. Uh, cinematographer for this film was Michael Reed. Uh, once again, oh, okay, good. So, as long as you can hear me. Okay, great. No problem, Kathy and Kent. Excellent. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, cinematography for this film is done by Michael Reed. Uh, he's mostly known for his Hammer horror films, uh, and in particular, two of my favorites, The Gorgon from 1964. I love that film. And then also um, Dracula, Prince of Darkness with Christopher Lee from 1965. Uh, this film was produced by Tovar or Ton Tonov Productions, which is a UK production company. Um, and it was distributed in the UK by Hemdell Studios and here in the US by American International Pictures. Uh, it was filmed entirely on location in Malta and in Port St. John, South Africa. Uh, it had a budget of about $9 million and it brought in uh, a box office receipt of about $15 million, uh, making it one of the more successful British films for this year of 1976. Um, and it did spend one week at the number one spot in Britain. Uh, so that's good news. Um, and it's, and I say loosely, I mean very loosely, based on the book by Wilbur Smith, uh, whose book was also very loosely based on facts, um, based around a ivory poacher named P.J. Pretorius uh, and the sinking of the Konigsberg, uh, which was a German-like cruiser in the early 1900s. All this happened prior, just, just prior to World War I, so we're on the eve of World War I as we're looking at this film. And I just want to get everybody's initial reaction. You know, what did you, what, what did you think of the film? Can you hear me? Sure, go ahead, Lisa. Um, personally, I wasn't a fan. <laughs> um, I don't know, these, these kinds of movies, I, I, I just hard for me to get into, but, um, it was out of the box and I'm here to talk with other people about it and maybe get a different perspective, so. Well, as, as everybody knows, there's been movies that I haven't liked, uh, you know, not liking the film is, is just fine. Um, I was a little torn between this one myself. Uh, how did everybody else uh, like this one? Uh, Deborah, you how did you like this one? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Kathy, Kent. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I I was torn, too. I, I enjoyed it um, uh, on certain levels, but just it was such a, it was a, three different movies all rolled into one. You know, I mean, it was the, couldn't I couldn't figure out if it was going to be a buddy movie at first or you know, and then turn into, and then it turned really dark in the middle and, and at the end and, you know, the heroics at the end and so forth. It, it was just, it was kind of a roller coaster ride, but I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not so much when I say I liked it, you know, 
yeah. like like but i enjoyed it i enjoyed watching it how about you kathy yeah i i just thought for one thing it went too long um mm -hmm. that that fight scene just seemed to be an excuse to <laughs> roll through the entire plantation yeah. home and and trash the place um and we also made the observation that that's a movie that you couldn't make today um, no. oh, because no. of the depictions of the colonial um colonialism and the way the um africans were treated and and so on i mean just like uh indiscriminate yeah. hangings of people and yeah you, you and just portrayed the way they portrayed them ian, ian holmes character and we'll get yeah. into that in yeah. a few yeah. minutes as well yeah. uh you, you're right there's absolutely no way that a film like that could be made in this day and age there, and eric i when i when i was looking for the movie it was a little hard to find uh, when i i found it i found the uk version oh. and i i um I looked it up and it was actually the UK version was 28 minutes longer than the one that released in the US in 76 or whatever. So Kathy and I ended up watching the, the long version. And during that fight scene, I said, there's about 20 minutes that could have cut out of that. <laughs> yeah, that was the one time that I didn't mind see Lee, Lee Marvin getting beat up. Uh, <laughs> and probably the only time you're going to see Lee Marvin get beat up in any film. Uh, he's, he's, he's a tough guy. Uh, Franklin, how about you? What did you think of the film? Yeah, I I liked it uh, quite a bit. You know, seeing scenes of Africa and uh, it was kind of you know James Bond teams up with a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's actually a very good description. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Deborah, how about you? I didn't see it. I'm listening to the discussion to see if I want to invest the time. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think you may come out with a very positive no on the end of this, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, the, the verdict's still out. And then lastly, Chris, how about you? I didn't like it. <laughs> uh, you, you have a question there about, what it, were you surprised by the final scene, I think it is? Yeah. Um, I got to the final scene, I was thinking, finally. <laughs> um, I, I just... I. I found it offensive and cartoonish on so many levels uh, that I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't take it seriously at all. Um, the uh, um, there, and in fact, there were times when I thought that they were actually going for comedy, and I, uh, I, I just didn't think that was that really, really captured it. It also, it also seemed to be a, um, uh, a variation on uh, African Queen. Uh, and African Queen was much better when they were trying to blow up the ship in the in the middle of Africa, um, and the and all I could think about with um, uh, Lee Marvin at several points was Dirty Dozen. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like you like you said, sorry, like you said, he was a little more cartoonish in this. Yeah. Uh, not not a little more. He was way more cartoonish in this yeah. than what he was in Dirty Dozen. Sometimes I found it nice for lack of a better term i guess because it, it showed lee marvin from a different angle um and at times i was just kind of off put by you know how silly he was being um, especially when his eyes would get really big and he's you know motioning toward the gin bottle constant constantly motioning toward the gin bottle <laughs> it's like okay you know once is enough but we're getting on a dozen times that he's doing this now and i just I, i'm not i'm not i'm not feeling it well, I never, did, I never... I did, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was going to say, and every time that uh, they wanted him to do something, it was always go to the bottle. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if that was, you know, a, a you know, a, a, a character trait of this PJ Pretorius uh, that they were basing that character off of, uh, but still, it just it just seemed a little over the top. I did like the film. I thought it was, you know, I thought it was fun. Um, Certainly, there are elements of it that uh, you know didn't set right, uh, but overall, you know, I, I I watched it again this afternoon, uh, bits and pieces anyway. Uh, it's probably the last time I'll ever go back to watching it, unless it just happens to come on on a Saturday when I'm not doing anything. Um, but uh, I, I liked it. I I I found it rather enjoyable. This was filmed between two James Bond films. They squeezed the filming in. Um, I can't remember which James Bond films. Ah, it's slipping my mind right now. 
Uh, but so the, the filming was kind of rushed. Uh, Kent, you said you saw the UK version that had an extra 28 minutes. There were, it was almost an hour shot from this movie that ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, so I guess in a sense, you're lucky that it was only 28 minutes extra that you had to watch <laughs> as opposed to another 50 minutes. Um, wow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, that would have that would have been started getting kind of excruciating. Yeah, it, it was kind of excruciating as it was, uh, especially <laughs> toward the end there. Um, let's start to get into some of these questions that I sent out. Uh, and the first question, you know, I want to talk about Lee Marvin's character, Flynn O'Flynn. Um, and you know, just did did he seem the type of person? Actually, I don't want to ask that question. I want to go on to the second one. Uh, we haven't talked about this uh, in any of our discussions yet, and that's war profiteering. And that's really what Lee Marvin's character struck me as, as a war profiteer, although this was set before, just before World War I. So I don't know if you could really characterize him as a war profiteer. Uh, he certainly is an adventurer. Um, but what did you think of, you know, overall Lee Marvin's character, uh, Flynn O'Flynn? Uh, did you like the character? You know, we've obviously you know, talked about a couple points already, but aside from those uh, that we've already discussed, what did you think of, of his character in this film? I just wondered where his moral compass was, you know, that he could do this, this poaching. And then as the film, you know, went along, obviously he had acquired all this wealth because he had this large plantation and the home and all those things. But, you know, as it went along, and then it became a war film and they're seeking out this ship, then his, it sort of shifted for, for me. Like, I just didn't know where he really stood on anything. Yeah, and it seems like once you, once you get him figured out, he, he throws you a curveball and he does something that, you know, you didn't expect. You, you, you expect to see his character develop. You see him, or you expect to see him try to, uh, you know, maybe grow up a little bit throughout the course of the film. Um, and he just keeps reverting back to his old ways. Uh, and I don't know if that was done on purpose to kind of throw the audience off, but uh, it certainly threw me off in many points. And just like you said, it was hard to, it was hard to figure him out. I sort of thought um, his, his relationship to Fleischer. Um, initially, Fleischer was treating him, it seemed to me, almost like Moby Dick, his white whale. Mm. And then those rela that relationship flipped towards the end of the film when when Limar or when uh, O'Flynn goes after Fleischer. Um, so I th it, that seemed to be the driving force, and uh, to me, in the movie between the characters, um, their their combative relationship with each other. Anybody else have any thoughts on Lee Marvin's character? Well, he he was combative with Sebastian too. Was, yeah. right? he, he was combative with every, even his own daughter. Yeah, well, he was competitive yeah. with Sebastian over his daughter. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I would agree with that. Um, you know, he, he didn't seem to have the best relationship with his daughter, but it was his relationship. Um, and then now Sebastian, or Bassy, as he kept calling him, uh, <laughs> is, is thrown into the mix. Um, and you know that uh, that little tinge of jealousy comes out. He, some she she's looking at somebody else, even though she doesn't look on me fondly. Um, at least she looked at me. Now she's looking somewhere else um, with with Sebastian. And yeah, he, he didn't care for that at all, as we saw in, in the fist fight sequence, uh, which <laughs> Kent so graciously pointed out was probably about twelve minutes long and probably about eleven minutes too long. What about Sebastian? What do you what, what did you think of his character? And I ask in the question, uh, let me bring it up here real quick. Uh, did you view him as, as kind of a naive aristocrat or was he an opportunist disguised as a gentleman? I, I thought he was a con man at first, you know, just just a, you know, a, a dandy who was just, you know, just going to con people and so forth. But, you know, his character obviously did develop as he became the hero of the movie um and uh <coughs> yeah that's how i started out feeling he was though not he was not really an aristocrat at all just a like i said sort of a con man pretending to be one and you know trying to be in the right circles and so forth right. anybody else want to comment on roger moore's character 
I agree because in the beginning he had that, uh, and I can't uh, come to an understanding of the value of the money that they're talking about. Mm-hmm. But it, what? Um, so, but he lost that little bag of money, and that was like, that was it. Like that was everything he had. So, <laughs> yeah, and he's and he's on his way to Australia, so he's still got quite a, an adventure ahead of him just to get to there. Yeah, so he wasn't really, you know, wealthy or aristocratic. But he was trying to be though. He was yes. he was going he was going to marry into money. Um, supposedly, uh, you know, we never really found out that this whole, you know, trip to Australia to get married if if that was just uh, a story or if it was actually you know what he was really going to do if it was really out there. We never found that out. I thought that, I thought there was a streak of naivete that uh, showed up in that fight scene. Um, where he's he's constantly um, playing Marquis of Ta- uh, Queensberry, um, despite all the each time O'Flynn would come back and, and sucker punch him, and yet it, that goes on two or three or four times, and he doesn't seem to learn the lesson, or else. Uh, and I just thought that was uh, either a form of naivete or, or uh, just stupidity. And it's 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 funny how those two are often very closely connected. <laughs> um, what about Ian Holmes' character? Um, you know, obviously we, we we've all kind of come to the consensus that you know this is not a film that can be made nowadays. Um, certainly, a short, very white British guy playing a native of some sort. We never really find out where he's from or, or anything because he doesn't talk. Uh, definitely not a whole lot of character development or, or serious work that he had to put into that character for sure. Um, but just as a, as a character from a film during this time period, what did you think of Ian Holm? He's, he's probably supposed to be a Muslim, right? I mean, they, what, they, with, with they, the they don't come out and say that he's wearing the fez and so forth. I, I guess I kind of thought a Muslim from Africa, somewhere in Northern Africa or somewhere anyway. It, uh, to answer your question way in advance, that was my favorite character, I think, <laughs> <laughs> just because of his loyalty. And, and, and he seemed to have connections everywhere for, you know, for no apparent reason, really. Um, but he always, you know, he came through for him every time with the connections they needed mm. with the natives and so forth. But yeah, it really bothered me that that it <laughs> was a white guy, obviously, you know, about as white as you can get. And uh, the the, portr- the casting was terrible, but I did kind of like the character. Yeah, and uh, well, I, I, well, you, you kind of jumped the gun a little bit there, Kent, uh, and I, I won't follow suit. I'll save it for a little bit later on. Um, but uh, I'm going to agree with you. I'll just leave it at that. How's that? Okay. Franklin, what do you think about Ian Holmes' character? Well, uh, it wouldn't be like the the last time because I I remember like Sala in Indiana Jones played by John Rhys Davies, you know, also being kind of a Middle Eastern guy played by a very British, also a Lord of the Rings actor. <laughs> yeah, uh, and he gets away with Gimli just fine. And I love Sala's character from Indiana Jones, but you are absolutely right. Um, you know, this, uh, this film market nowadays looks to cast people in their roles authentically. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, you know, it, it probably should have been done, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, the mindset wasn't there. Uh, even in 1976, the mindset really wasn't there. And it's still not even there yet, um, although it is getting better. Um, but it still is a, a, a problem within not only just Hollywood, but within the whole universe of motion picture making. Um, can, to kind of go back to what you said about his character and how he, you know, just seemed to be able to come up with anything at any time. Um, I thought that he was probably maybe the smartest character out of the whole film. Um, mm-hmm. Or, or maybe sm- the smartest isn't quite the right word. He certainly had the most level head on his shoulders than anybody else. I'll say it that way. How's that? Yes. Um, he, he seemed a little uh, soft. Um, I don't know how to say it. He did all the sewing. I mean, I know that he was, uh, you know, fixing those uniforms, but he did the sewing. And then when he was in, uh, I don't remember 
the German guy's uh, quarters, it, the things that he was taking were like teacups and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things that were just a little different. And then, um, but then when they were in that scene with the, uh, where they kept giving the money away, he kept wanting, he kept pulling out the, uh, what's it called? The news? Yes. He kept yes. pulling that, he kept pulling that out. And I, and I don't know, I, maybe I missed something. I didn't get, I didn't no, I get that. It didn't seem like it went with his character. I don't think you missed anything, Lisa. There's, there, there's just some time <laughs> during this movie when I think all of us were just scratching our heads going, what? Okay. <laughs> I was like, it didn't fit his character, and I just didn't know what was going on there. So I thought maybe he was pulling out the noose in part because he saw that, based on his own experience and why he couldn't talk, um, as the way that you uh, uh, visited retribution on people that wouldn't cooperate with you. Kind of, kind of like a warning, you mean, Chris? Yeah, kind of. Like yeah. the evil eye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I, I kind of want to touch on this a little bit as well. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the film, first of all, it said that this is based on a true story. Uh, we all know that that is not the case. Uh, the book itself claimed to be based on a true story, but it played very fast and loose with not only the historical accuracy, but also just the facts surrounding, uh, you know, the sinking of the Konigsberg and this um, P.J. Praetorian. Uh, or Pretorius rather, uh, this ivory hunter. And I'm not even sure that those two are connected in any way. Um, I think maybe uh, Wilbur Smith, the author, uh, just kind of used both of them to bring, you know, two storylines together to try to try to create um, this whole uh, screenplay or the book rather. Um, and kind of, I can't remember who mentioned it earlier, but somebody said something about how this film um, probably should just, I can't remember the exact words, uh, but my point is that they were supposed to make three more films based off of this storyline. Uh, those films never got made. Uh, shock, total shock. Uh, but not only did they claim that this film was based on, on fact, but it also claimed that no animals were harmed during the, the, the shooting of this film. And then 20 minutes in, we have the elephant hunt scene. Um, I don't know how you all felt about that scene. I had to skip through most of it. I, 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 I could not watch that. Um, I'm too much of an animal lover and I don't care if it was faked or not. And I know it wasn't faked, it was actual footage from a real elephant hunt, not that they did for this film, but it was stock footage uh, probably that they bought from Universal or somebody um, to put into the film. But I just, I really didn't care for that. I had a very hard time watching it so much so that I yeah. couldn't watch it and I had to skip through it. But what did you, what did, what did everybody else think of that elephant hunt scene? I'm, I'm glad to know that uh, it was stock footage because I kept thinking, how could they possibly not be harming, how could they be reenacting that without harming any animals? Um, so I'm sure that's why they had to do that disclaimer two or three different times. Mm -hmm. So people would say, well, somehow they, they did not harm those animals. But I was wondering how they could possibly not have. Um, and uh, it, it didn't, to, to tell you the truth, I mean, it was disturbing, yes. I never had to, there's a lot of times in movies, especially these war movies, I have to close my eyes for a while. And uh, I didn't really have to with that one. Um, so I, I'm ashamed of myself, I guess, but no, I mean, I could watch it. I, 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 I wasn't, I wasn't happy or anything, but I did, I was able to watch that whole thing. There were other parts of the movie that I, that I did close my eyes. I didn't like that. I mean, it it just opened with it was like one, then another one, and another one. You're like, it was seriously? like the fight scene. You, you know, yeah. they just kept going and going and going. They, they, you know, they like, they could have done elephant? thirty seconds and given yeah. us the impression, and that would have been fine. But no, it was picking one elephant off after another one after another one. You're like, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the I, hanging scene I, as well. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Chris. Yeah, I was going to say I don't. I don't think it was intentional, but to me, it kind of emphasized the um, the character of the business that O'Flynn was in, 
and what uh, and the brutality of what he was what he was engaged in. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll I'll tell everybody right now. There's no way I could have ever done anything like that. I don't care what time period it is. Um, although you know you say that, but you know mentalities are different based on different time periods. Um, you know we're living in 2022. Um, you know certainly in 1910, uh, 100 years ago, people were thinking far differently. They had far different emotions. They had different feelings, although the same as what we have now. But they just applied them differently to um, you know their their aspects of life. Um, it was just a different time in a different world, but still, that was that that elephant hunt scene. That elephant scene, hunt scene was too much for me. I just I couldn't. That was that was right on par with uh, Steve McQueen um, crawling down underneath that crankshaft. Um, uh, if you remember that scene from that film that we watched, uh, what was it? Chris, give me a hand here. Sand pebbles. Uh, Sand pebbles. Yeah. Yes. Boy, when he climbed down to that crankshaft, I just, I, I, oh, I had to turn my head. I couldn't watch that. <laughs> well, I'm glad so that, really. you know, as graphic as the elephant scenes were, I'm glad that when the uh, plantation gets burned to the ground and, and uh, the baby is taken from her mother's arms, I'm glad we didn't have to see a depiction of a infant being murdered. I, I, I'm right there with you, Kathy. I was really hoping that they just kind of skipped over that and didn't show it in the detail that they were showing everything else. Yeah. Uh, we, we kind of got lucky there, I suppose. Right, and the <laughs> detail that you were talking about showing everything else. Yeah, I thought, I thought it's pretty brutal and callous, the way they just jump up and start shooting and then like the, the Native people are like pulling the the, that big wheel and stuff and then they just jump up and start picking them off and they're like oh my god like they're not even like in battle really they're just getting picked off easily and um then the like the piece of metal it, it's so, so you're seeing all these people um being so easily butchered I think it almost felt to me like the elephants. And you know, that is an excellent point. And that's not a point I had thought of either time I had watched it. Uh, and maybe you're right though. Maybe the director was trying to, and maybe that's why the elephant scene was, the hunting scene was so long because he was trying to make that comparison about how colonial entities thought of the native inhabitants. Um, they didn't think of them as anything more than the animals in the, in the surround. Um, that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point, Lisa. Uh, usually I would say that I have to go back and watch it with some of these different viewpoints that I get from everybody on these movie discussion nights. Um, but I, I, will, I will not go back. Uh, sorry, Lisa. I'll not go back and, and watch this uh, just to see that different viewpoints. Um, you know, as much as I did like the movie, I, I'm not going <laughs> to um, but you did bring up a good point, Lisa, and I do want to kind of move on to um, the scene where the uh, the plantation is is raided, burned to the ground. Um, very very horrible um, actions attributed to you know once again the native population. Um, I, I I I'm going to have to say they they did that on purpose. Uh, they didn't you know, make the Germans do that. They didn't make anybody else do that. They left it to the native population of, you know, this colonial entity. Um, and once again, like, like it was pointed out earlier, that wouldn't fly in movie making nowadays. Uh, the audience would be in an uproar if that was anywhere in a movie and rightly so. Um, but what about not only the treatment, um, but also O'Flynn and his daughter. What 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 came from that scene? How, how how did it really affect them, particularly his daughter? She wanted revenge. Yeah, at all costs. At all costs. <laughs> I mean, she was willing to just give everything up in order to to get that revenge. At the, at that one point, you could see. Uh... Sebastian, when she took that 
German in the in the bush there that when they had his prisoners. Um, when uh, he he came up on it and he he just stood there and looked. He was he shocked like this is a completely different person now. Yeah. They didn't really, for me, they didn't really flesh out her character as much as could have been done, you know, and, and it got into those sort of old stereotypes of the damsel in distress. Um, you know, for one thing, after the plantation is burned to the ground, suddenly she's got a change of clothing, you know, she's got the, the leather boots and, you know, the whole thing. But um, so, you know, that, that kind of, turned me off a little bit but then in the in the ship when she's supposedly you know being held captive and then this sort of struggle ensues you know she doesn't take it upon herself to to jump in and you know start defending anybody she just lets you know like so many scenes we've seen in a lot of movies the the woman stands back and shrieks while the two men are fighting yeah, there's a knife sitting on the desk or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. she, she could have stabbed the guy, you know, while they were struggling. It was two against one, basically. Uh, yeah, I, I had the same feeling. Why, why isn't she doing something, helping out? Especially with her, her motivation of revenge. I mean, you know, she was hellbent. Um, but yeah, no, I, I kind of had the same question. You know, if she's so determined to get this revenge, why is she not doing anything? <laughs> At least in that scene. You know, mm -hmm. many other scenes, she, she was cutthroat, uh, but that scene in particular, yeah, she just kind of stood back and, and let things happen. Um, I kind of want to move on a little bit, uh, and, and uh, Franklin really brought this question to the fore, although it's, it's been in my mind ever since I started going over these questions, uh, but he talked about the scenery. He talked about Africa. Uh, and of course, you all know me and how much I love my cinematographers. Um, <laughs> what did you think about Michael Reed's, uh, uh, you know, cinematography, especially given the landscapes that he had to work with? Yeah, it was uh, really good to see. Uh, I'll even mention uh, Malta with all the old castles, even with the modern uh, naval officers walking through them. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I love cinematography. I will watch a film just to see how it's shot, um, much less for the acting or the directing or anything else. Um, and I got to say, Michael Reed did a superb job on this. I thought he, he really framed his shots well. Um, I, I did not look up to see what type of um, equipment they were using, but they really got, I mean, th this was almost on level with Bridge on the River Kwai, I thought, as far as some of the scenes that they shot and what they were able to capture on film. Um, and then especially like Franklin said, you know, they not only did you get some really expansive, just beautiful scenery shots, but you also got a feel of what this place was like, um, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, maybe even as much as 100 years ago with some of the set uh, uh, production that they had going on also. Anybody all else? Of this, all of this before drones. Oh, it must have been helicopter shot from helicopters or something. Um, the, those I, vast expanses from the air, you know. I would imagine maybe one or two helicopter shots, um, but with the way they had everything in front of them, and just if you can just imagine everything that was surrounding them at the time as well, I think it's just a lot of boom shots, quite honestly. Mm, wow. Uh, some nice okay. long boom shots. Uh, maybe, you know, dangling off the top of a building somewhere or, you know, just a, a super high boom that comes up over the trees. Um, but, yeah. Chris, did you have, uh, you had, it looked like you were about to say something? Well, it didn't have to do with the scenery so much, but there was a point in the, in the film, I think it was in the, uh, uh, the officer's quarters on the, on the ship, where it seemed like, it seemed like the um, film became much clearer I mean, the, the, the contrast seemed to be, it was almost like they shot it with a different uh, kind of equipment than, than it had been in, in other parts of the film. And I was, I was just kind of taken by that. I, I mean, that's, that's what struck me. Um, and I, I actually thought that, the, um, that that was 
that if they could have done that in the rest of the movie, it would have it would have helped. I, I didn't notice that at all. Um, and once again, I'm not going to go back to take a look. Uh, but no, I, I didn't notice that. Uh, and wow, man, now now I've got two really good points of contention. Maybe I will have to go and stuff. <laughs> I don't think oh. it's worth it. <laughs> I like what Franklin said about Malta. I and I don't know anything about Malta. And I was like, wow, that's really built up. And that's like, it gave me a little insight as as to the area and what was going on. Um, the one one thing that stood out to me uh, with camera is when uh, Sebastian was on a beach or something, and that he zoomed in on that crab. He spent like a oh, yeah. <laughs> minute on that crab. And I, and I was like, yeah. like, its mouth moved and it did this or something. It was like. That was that was a little odd to me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to say that, that 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 wasn't the cinematographer. That was the director telling the cinematographer what okay. to shoot. I I could be way wrong about that, but I'm just gonna go with that to make myself feel a little bit better about Michael Reed's work. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and the introduction of the uh, scene with the with the early airplane, you know that that involved a cinematography. Uh, angle as well because then you got to see that the the geography of the place and the winding river and so on um, gave me the sense of just the um, the terrain was challenging for anything that that the white man went in to try to do um, you know they didn't even really have a proper airfield or anything they just landed it on the beach but um, it, it was just a, it, that part I thought was just really beautiful the the lushness of it and um, I don't think the uh, the two guys in the plane were enjoying the sights so much but uh, I sure did was it just me or in that scene did it look like Roger that was not really Roger Moore it was obviously a stunt double yeah. or something who wasn't oh, yeah. very good he didn't look very much like Roger Moore he was like hefty kind of hefty and his mm -hmm. cheeky you know big cheeks and stuff and I thought you know, I can't even believe that's Roger Moore, you know, or Sebastian in yeah, that plane. Um, I got confused too. Okay, I thought it was, maybe it was just me, but. No, I can guarantee you that was definitely a stunt double and a, a stunt double flying that plane, that old jalopy of a plane uh, with the, the, the rear propeller. Um, they actually had to build that plane and another one for this film from scratch, they could not find any original planes, uh, or that plane in particular, they couldn't find any original models. Uh, so they had to build those from scratch. Uh, and that looked like the most sketchy piece of aviation equipment probably ever put up in the air. Uh, so there's no way that you're gonna have a major Hollywood star, <laughs> much less James Bond, jumping that thing. I, you know, I don't know. I kinda, it looked really cool to sit in that front seat with no propeller in front of you, uh, just winding through that river. But I would be terribly nervous that entire time. That would be worse than a roller coaster ride for me. It, it also had a little bit of that uh, Star Wars feel to me, where they're you know in this kind of canyon of uh, you know following the course of the river, but you know they're they're uh, blocked on both sides by the bluffs and so on. Yeah, no, I, I could definitely see that. I, once again, that's not an impression that I got when I was watching it. Uh, Star Wars was not on my mind, although it is one of my favorite motion picture franchises. Um, but yeah, no, I could definitely see that. Right down the slit trench of the Death Star, you know, getting yeah. ready to, to launch those two torpedoes right into that porthole. And, um, that, Kent, that was definitely one of the scenes where there was some sort of aviation uh, used in filming that, whether it was a helicopter or a plane. But um, yeah, there's that... That, that was one of my, my favorite scenes, at least visually. Um, mm -hmm. The whole thing, the, the plane landing on the beach, taking off, uh, you know, cruising through um, the, the valley there, just, you know, a few feet above the river. Um, I just thought Michael Reed did a really good job with the cinematography, maybe better than any of the James Bond films that I've seen him work on. So, I don't know. Um, we only have about 20 minutes left. I still got a few more questions I want to go over. Um, and we haven't really talked about, um, and I'm going to mess his name up again, Reinhardt Koldehoff at all, uh, but the character of Fleischer. 
Uh, what did you think about that? And, 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 and I'll get everybody's kind of perception on just the character itself before I start getting into some of the, the symbology um, that the director was going with with that. But what, what did you think of Fleischer's character? Well, he was such a comic character at first. I mean, you know, or almost you know, stereotypical, um, you know, with the ride and the mule and and just being over, you know, so over the top on everything and didn't seem menacing at all as he turned out, as it turned out, he seemed later in the movie. Um, and even then he was not, you know, he was carrying out, I mean, I, I don't know. I, it was a it was a very conflicted character. I think I, I never quite knew where, where he was. That was one of the comic elements I saw at the beginning of the movie. That I thought, you know, why are they going for comedy here? And then, uh, you know, he turned into someone menacing. I don't know. I was confused. Like many other points of this movie, Kent, just like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he was a kind of a bumbling character, uh, the mustache and just, uh, they even had him, what, that scene on the hill, they had him using the bathroom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. He had to go use the bathroom. <laughs> and, you know, if I could just add real quick, that was another fantastic uh, shot uh, during that whole scene <laughs> of just that whole hillside. And not only that, but I mean, how many extras did they have out there pulling those carts or, or holding them from falling down the hill? Um, I just, I thought they did a really good job of shooting that scene um, and just really creating the visuals um, that, 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 I don't know, I guess the visuals more than anything else set the movie, you know, up above for me, um, as opposed to the acting of the storyline. Um, and then Lisa, like you just mentioned, you know, when we first meet Fleischer, he's riding that mule. Why is he riding a mule? There, there's, there's some definite symbology. There's some definite uh, points that the director is trying to make in the storyline. But what's, what's, what's the, the, the purpose of the mule? Why isn't he riding a horse or in a car or something like that? He was sent to this outpost and, you know, he, he had a title and so on, but to me, he just didn't seem like he had any true power um, because he was so far from the action until there was actually some action. Um, and he was just, yeah, he was just kind of a clown early on. I thought, a, I, thought, I thought a little bit, well, my initial reaction was he was on the mule because that was a symbolic, symbolic of a jackass. But um, and uh, but in a in a more serious uh, sense, I think he saw himself as sort of a, a protector and a savior of that part of the world, and so riding on riding on the mule may have been symbolic of Jesus on the on the mule on the, uh, riding riding into Nazareth. Um, uh, but that's about as close as I could come to you know any symbology in the whole thing. <laughs> no, that's actually that's that's actually a really good point. Um, once again, that's that's not something that occurred to me when I was watching that. What occurred to me was, uh, you know, Germany at this time, as they're going into World War One, uh, you know, their their whole mentality was you know, they want their place in the sun. You know, Britain has their place in the sun. Uh, America just got some colonies, so they're starting to have their place in the sun. France, Spain, all these other colonial countries have their place in the sun, but Germany doesn't have theirs yet. And now they're starting to get a hold in Africa. But for me, the mule symbolized, together with Fleischer, what Germany wanted to be, which was Fleischer, and what they really were, which was the mule. They hadn't really elevated themselves to the horse or the car yet, uh, so to speak. They were still the mule as far as the rest of the world saw it. Um, mm. that's, you know, that, that's what I took out of it. Uh, and then especially uh, with Fleischer's actions as well, um, you know, he, 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 wants, he wants to catch Flynn. He wants his notoriety. Um, he wants his territory. Uh, and, and he kind of gets it into a degree and he gets to become this territorial commander. Um, but his, his actions really struck me as, you know, a, a, a kind of a synopsis of Germany as a whole during this time. We deserve all this. We want all this. We just don't have it yet. And 
we're going to try really hard to get it, but that still remains to be seen whether we're going to do it or not. I can see that. Uh, what, sorry. Uh, what do you think? Uh, you think this film? Oh, yes, the belligerency question. Um, I, I asked if this film dealt with concepts of belligerency a little more realistic than other films that we've seen. Um, and what I meant by that question is, do you think that some of the actions, not only by Fleischer, but also by Flynn, by Sebastian, by the natives, do you think that, that it really showed some of the horrors of war or the horrors of being on the verge of war a little better or maybe a little more intensely than some other movies that we watched? I thought it showed, go ahead. Oh, you first, Chris. <laughs> I thought it showed the belligerency of colonialism more than, more than the belligerency yeah. of war. Okay. I mean, the, the, the stuff that was going on with the war just seemed like almost normal belligerency. I didn't see it as, as, as more or less than what we've seen in other films, but I thought it really captured, uh, certainly in the modern, from a modern view of it, um, the, the horror and the belligerency of, of colonial occupation. I agree with that. I agree. Kathy, did you want to, did you have something well, to I say? Just, yeah, I just didn't feel like it was building toward a war movie per se. You know, it seemed like it just sort of simmered along with this colonial theme and, and the activities and the, the poaching and all those other things, the shaking people down for their taxes. It just didn't feel like war was imminent. You know that, that something was just soon going to happen that would change the the calculus of who was on which side. Yeah, and that makes total sense. Um, and and you know, just hearing you say that, and just you know, brief, briefly thinking back in the film, I, I can totally see where you know that sentiment comes from. Um, as a military historian, World War One is you know one of my one of my favorite periods to study. Uh, and so maybe I, I think maybe I came into the film hoping to, you know, ca get, get a little glimpse of, of World War I that we don't normally see. Uh, we always see the trenches, you know, we always see the generals and the soldiers, but we, but, you know, World War I was a total world war. Uh, and we usually don't get to see any of uh, the, the outlying pieces of it. And so maybe I just came into the film, you know, really hoping uh, from the very first frame to see how this time period in this war was really affecting this area. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe I just kind of blocked out the whole colonization. I didn't block it out, but I looked at it more as trying to, you know, I, I want to see these glimpses of World War I. Um, and, and whenever I watch a World War I film, I always want to see those glimpses. I want to see how they portray it and how they film it. Um, and so maybe that's just, I was just hoping to see more of that. And, and I had that in my head the whole time, but you're absolutely right. Uh, that, that's a, a fantastic way of looking at it. Uh, and it seems to be that that's how, um, you know, most everybody else on this uh, call looked at it as well. Uh, so maybe that's just my blinders uh, as opposed to everybody else seeing it a little more clearly than myself. Hey, Aaron, um, there was the angle of the Portuguese, you know, being the, the Portuguese side where they lived and so forth. Um, and then, you know, when the war started, um, what, was the, what were the Portuguese, were they involved in the war right at, at the start or not? I, 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 I can't give you a good answer. To run into it. I don't Honestly. know. I just, you know, all of a sudden there was just still the Portuguese territory there and war, I suppose, was going to be waged on that part of the continent too, but. I just wondered what their role was at the start of the war. That's, and, and that's a fantastic question. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, Kent, I just don't have a good answer. Uh, the whole Portugal angle is not something that's really covered in the historiography of World War I, unless you know, you're, you're digging down into those finer details. Um, and I'm, I, as you're asking that, I'm trying to think you know, just briefly, 
you know, everything I've read and studied and watched and looked at. And I really, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything either in book, film, lecture, anything. Um, yeah. It just I've seems never, like they're, they're, they're not involved. You know, you, you never hear about them being involved. I don't yeah. Know. No, you don't. And, and so when you ask, you know, what their role was, and, and I, I just, I don't have a good answer. Uh, but, you know, certainly now that that gives me some food for thought, uh, and I know what I'll be doing uh, for the first half hour after we're done here. <laughs> you got to watch this movie again, Eric. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 don't make me do it. Don't make me do it. I, I had two points. One was with Kathy. Um, you mentioned earlier a storyline. I didn't feel a storyline. I didn't know what the problem was, really, and where we were going. It just seemed like these scenes of different things that were connected. I might have missed somewhere. I was distracted when I was watching this, so I might have missed something. So that was my first thing. The second thing is the, colon the colonization comments. Um, a lot of that really stood out to me, and I think part of it, and I'm going to go out on the limb here. You don't need to comment, but um, listening to the UN Kenya ambassador speak, and to speak about with the, the Ukraine invasion and with colonization and just being very upfront and forward about what he said and understanding. I think that sometimes when you're not the entity, you don't fully comprehend. And so uh, I think that, that I, was, I was actually thought of him and thought of what he said this week when I when I was watching this. That that's an excellent uh, point, Lisa. Uh, and and you're absolutely right. I don't think anybody can you, you can study and and everything else, but unless you're there, um, you know, witnessing all the different aspects of what's going on, you can't comprehend. You can't you can't put yourself in that time period. You can't put yourself in that place. You can't put yourself in those instances. Um, you think you can, uh, and you could try your best to get a sense of of what it might be like. Uh, but unless you're actually there with the smells, the sights, the feelings, the emotions, <laughs> everything else, um, you just don't get the overall picture. You don't get the sense of what it really is to be going through whatever struggle, you know, happens to be going on or we're talking about. It. Um, and then as far as the storyline, you didn't miss anything. Uh, <laughs> it, it really just kind of jumped from here to there. Uh, and it was a, you know, if, if, if you weren't just turned off and just enjoying the film, if you were actually putting even the most minuscule bits of thought into it, it really was disjointed. Uh, the storyline didn't go, the, the, the acting, it didn't seem like there was a great deal of character development. Uh, Lee Marvin seemed like he was Lee Marvin. Roger Moore seemed like he was Roger Moore. Every night after they were done, those two were off drinking you know, vodkas and, and, and gins together. Uh, the director said they never showed up the next day hungover or, or under any <laughs> but they were they were pretty much tearing it up every single night after filming was done. Um, and like I said, for as, as much as I thought this film was fun, uh, there's certainly a lot to be left to be desired uh, from a lot of the filmmaking aspects. Uh, screenplay definitely being one. Can I offer a, an aside on uh, on something that? caught my attention. Um, when I heard the name of the, of the um, ship, Blucher, mm -hmm. the first thing that came to mind was that running gag in Young Frankenstein. <laughs> and I, and I wondered, Fra Blucher, yeah. And I wondered if there, was, if there was any connection that Mel Brooks had borrowed from that or, or vice versa. Um, um, so I went, I went looking and it turns out that there was actually a Prussian field marshal who fought against Napoleon in a couple of major battles led an army in a couple of major battles, named Blucher. And I kind of suspect that that, that, uh, that may have been the uh, basis for the naming of, the, of that ship. <laughs> it, it, would not surprise, it would not surprise me if Mel Brooks found some little detail that he could just exploit in a film of his <laughs> from a historical you know, past. Uh, well, it, it, turns, it turns out that he, he had read something by Sigmund Freud uh, and that somebody named Blucher had written to Freud <laughs> And um, he said, that's a German name. 
I was going to use that. <laughs> so. Uh, we're going to get to the last questions of the night. My, my famous question, I think, hang on, I want to just double check my notes here. I know I had something else as far as actors go. Chemistry between Roger Moore and Lee. We'll, we'll work these two questions in together. Uh, who was your favorite character in the film and why? Um, and as we're probably going to be focusing on the two main characters, um, you know, how, how did you see Roger Moore and Lee Marvin's relationship in the film? Um, and, and we'll start on the opposite end of the screen for where I'm at. So we'll start with Kathy and Kent first. And Kent, we already know who you who you yeah, like. Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's hard for me to have a favorite character because I just didn't think that anybody was real well rounded or or um, believable. Huh? So you know, I kept seeing Lee Marvin. I kept seeing Roger Moore. I wasn't seeing the character. Um. So you know, I just if I had. Bumped into this movie, like you say, on a Saturday night, I would have turned it off after five minutes because, and I'm, and I'd be glad I did. I, 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 wow, well, I know Ro neither Roger Moore nor uh, Lee Marvin will catch wind of any of this. So I, I think we're safe. Uh, we're not going to um, offend either of those two. Uh, Franklin, how about you? Well, I'd like to say Roger Moore because, but he didn't really. Uh, escape from being typecast as the James Bond type, uh, you know, know it all and do it all kind of guy. So I'll actually say Rosa because I think the sort of like descending to um, revenge and finding out that it's empty, you know, trying to come back from that is uh, a yeah, dark but uh, pretty sophisticated plot. But was revenge empty for her though? At the, at the very really sort of cheered up afterwards. Yeah. Now, Lisa. Um, I didn't, I didn't have a favorite character and I knew, I, I, I registered late, I didn't get the questions, but I know this is a question, so I was like, okay, who's my favorite character? I, I couldn't come up with anything. And since the group is small, I just want to say, um, I've never said this before, but um, I have two children and both of them are in the military. And uh, so one of them's, I don't know where, I don't know where he's at right now. So. I almost didn't show up tonight because knowing about my son and then watching what's going on, it was almost hard to be here, to almost justify being here. I'm right there with you, Lisa. Uh, I have a son in the military. He's over in Korea right now. Um, and I, I, got a, I got a text message uh, from him first thing, uh, what was it, yesterday morning. Uh, it was like 2 o'clock my time in the morning. He's let me know he's okay. Uh, he hasn't heard anything yet, um, but I, I am, am right there with you. Uh, and, and actually, I was talking with my ex-wife yesterday, just letting her know, hey, let's keep a line of communication open. If you hear something, if I hear something, uh, and we're both former military as well, and she said, you know, this is a lot harder as a parent than it is as a, as a soldier, and I couldn't agree more. Um, so I, I just, just not to go off topic, but no, uh, no. You're, you're not yeah. alone, Lisa? My son was somewhere in Europe helping out. So I don't know because he can't disclose. But Right, um, yeah. But just to justify being here, it's like it's hard to, to know what's happening to people in another part of the world and then to be on a movie discussion. It's like. Yeah, and it seems kind of superfluous, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I hope your son stays safe uh, as with everybody else that's over there. Um, it's not a good situation. But I was uh, like, I was almost said, you know, I wasn't going to show. And then I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll show tonight. And I'm glad I'm here. So It, it does help take your mind off it a little bit, uh, give you something else to focus on for a little while. Uh, as soon as we're done here, you're going to go right back to worrying 100% again. So, uh, but I, I hope he's safe somewhere, wherever he's at. Thanks. Chris? I think like most everybody, I think like most everybody else, I did not have a favorite character. Um, I just, I just couldn't, couldn't glom on to any of them. Um, but there was one scene, and this, this left me a bit disconcerted. Um, it was a scene where the Nazi officer um, just berates Fleischer. Um, 
uh, as just just tells him he's not going to he's not going to carry out the the murders that Fleischer wants him to carry out. Mm. And and what struck me was that this, it, it kind of ran against the notion of a, of a Nazi commander uh, having some principle. Well, these were Nazis at the time, though. World War well, One. Okay, uh, German, a German, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, but a German commander, just a German commander, not uh, having some sort of, having some sense, um, regardless of what the war is. I, I mean, maybe, you know, retrospectively, it looks that, uh, it wasn't, you're right, it wasn't a Nazi, but it, I just had this feeling that um, I did, he seemed more honorable than I would have expected. Fair point, fair point. Uh, and that actor, I cannot recall his name, uh, but he played Field Marshal Rommel in the movie Patton, if you remember, mm -hmm. uh, with George C. Scott. Um, so I, I was kind of happy to see him. I've seen him in a couple smaller roles in World War II movies as well. Um, and, and like I said, I can't recall his name right now. Uh, my favorite character, I'm going to go with, with Kent. Uh, I'm, I'm a big Ian Holm fan. Uh, he's done a lot of good films. Uh, and then, of course, um, you know, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit trilogies. Um, you know, I said Star Wars is one of my favorite film franchises. The only one that goes up above that is Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit films. Um, and of course him playing Bilbo Baggins. But I liked his character in, in this movie. Like I said, there wasn't a great deal of character development. He didn't have to put in a whole lot of work. He didn't even have any lines, but it was all through uh, motions and, and facial uh, expressions. And I just thought yes, that, yes. yeah, and gestures. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just, I thought that, that and it, like I said, he, he struck me as, as maybe the, the smartest character uh, in the film. Uh, he seemed to know what was going on more than anybody else and was ready to react quicker than anybody else. Uh, I was a little sad at the end when he uh, got killed, um, but yeah, there it is. It was the end of the film, so I was just ready, really ready to get it over with by that point. Uh, Next month, if I'm not mistaken, somebody please correct me. We are watching Free State of Jones. Yes? Yes. I am definitely looking forward to that. Um, Matthew McConaughey. Yes? yes? Oh, yeah. Not Christian <laughs> Bale. I keep getting those. I don't know why I get Christian Bale and, and Matthew McConaughey confused, uh, but I do constantly. Um, <laughs> Kathy's a big fan, so this should, this should be good. Kathy's a big Matthew McConaughey fan. so it's a, He's it's a, a great actor. He's a fantastic yeah. actor. I, I really am not a huge <laughs> Matthew McConaughey fan. But I can appreciate um, his, his his abilities, uh, and and as he progresses in his career, he just seems to get better and better as an actor. Um, so I'm and, and I I haven't seen this film yet, so I'm looking forward to it. Chris, if I'm not mistaken, this was your suggestion, your recommendation. It might very well have been because I, I I I've seen it and I, I thought it was well done. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to that. So next month. Uh, we'll be watching or we'll be talking about Free State of Jones. So everybody, um, you know, try to find that on your whatever subscriptions you're using. Uh, I have Roku. So I have many different platforms that go on with Roku. And I haven't found it for free on any platforms yet. Uh, so I think if, if you're going to join us for next month's discussion, you're going to have to be right along with me and pay your you know, four or five bucks uh, to rent it and watch it. Unless you just uh, want to go out and buy it, uh, which you're more than welcome to do. And before we go, I see Lisa wants to say just something real quick. I just wanted to say those people who weren't playing trivia, uh, I think Chris was there last time. So um, yeah, it was like, a good time. I'd like to see you come out. Yeah, you know, we uh, and actually Lisa, Molly and I were talking about this uh, before we got on tonight. Um, you know, you started out joining us for movie nights and then we saw you in Drink and Draws and now we're seeing you at Trivia. Um, you know, just, and, and here we go, I'm gonna toot my own horn. Uh, or all our horn uh, as a museum and, and as a whole, we put out some really fantastic virtual programming. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. And so, you know, if 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 you want to expand your horizons a little bit and see what else the West what else the Wisconsin Veterans Museum has to offer, I would definitely recommend joining us for a trivia night. Um, uh, and you know, some of our other uh, great programming, um, but uh, definitely for trivia, it's a lot of fun. Molly and myself and uh, our other uh, team, our teammate, uh, Beth Stofflet, we put a lot of work into coming up with those questions. Uh, we come up with these questions every single month. And like I've said before, we've got enough to put a whole book together 
because we've been doing this for two years now, 36 questions a month, you do the math. Um, and then all the facts that go with it as well. We have to look up all these facts just to make sure that we're not putting a bunch of nonsense out there uh, to go along with these questions. So it's, it's a lot of work for us, but it's our favorite event. We love doing trivia. I love doing these movie nights, but as a whole for the education team, I think trivia is probably our, our most favorite one to do. So and you should, you should turn it into a book or multiple books. <laughs> Seriously. And, and, and I've talked with my director about that, uh, but at the same time, I just, I really feel a sense of ownership on those questions and I don't want to give them up to anybody else. I've had other people ask me if they could use my questions and I'm kind of like, mm, no, no, those, that's, that's our content. We want to keep it. We love do you it. Know, do you know of any other uh, institution and that does what, what all you guys do? Because you're like a model. Oh, I mean, thank you. That's, that's, that, that makes me feel fantastic. And it makes me feel 10 feet tall hearing that. Um, I know there's other institutions out there that do smaller, you know, pieces of what we do. They don't do the whole total package. Um, and I've had a few other institutions come to me and say, you know, hey, we've noticed that, that you, you guys do this and this and this. Can you help us? Um, can you give us some advice or some hints or some tips? And I have talked with uh, uh, many other uh, museums and, and nonprofits uh, around the U.S. since we've been doing our virtual programming. Um, but I, I haven't come across an, uh, another one that, that does everything that we do. And not, you know, I, 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 I'm a very humble person. I don't like to toot my own horn, uh, but I haven't seen any other institutions do what we do as, and as well as we do it. Yeah. So anyway. I'm, I'm appreciative, thank you. Oh, we're, we're glad that, uh, what we're appreciative of is that everybody joins us. They like what we're doing. They're, uh, they're engaged with the content, whether it's this or trivia or anything else. Yeah. Um, and so just, you know, our, our lack of a better term, fan base, our audience members, uh, you know, to see them come back time and time again and expand into our other programming, that's what does it for me. That's what, that's what gives me that feel, that, that good feeling inside. So thank you, Lisa, for, you know, showing up and, and, and participating in all these other events, Chris as well, and Kathy, uh, Kent, Franklin, you know, hopefully we'll see you guys at some other events too. Um, you can always find them on our website, wisvetsmuseum.com slash events. Uh, you can just sign right up for all of our virtual events, just like you can for our movie night discussions. They're all free. Uh, they don't cost you a dime. And uh, they're usually a pretty good time. And the museum itself is great, Eric. Uh, if you're, when you, if any of you are in Madison and uh, looking for something good to do for about a uh, couple, three hours, uh, the museum is great. Yeah, we uh, yeah. saw Kathy and Kent in there uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, got a phone call sitting in my office and, hey, there's some people down here you might know. So I came down and introduced myself. It was just great to see uh, people that I see on video screens all the time to actually see them live and in person. So Yeah, it was cool. Yeah, thanks for coming down. Oh, thanks for coming out, especially, uh, you know, for an hour's drive as well. All right, I hope everybody has a great rest of your weekend. Uh, I'm going to start mine off here by not watching Shot at the Devil again. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, we hope to see everybody at some of our other events. And if nothing else, uh, we'll see you next month for Free State of Jones. Um, thanks again for joining us tonight, guys. Thanks again, once again, for another great conversation and just bringing up all your, uh, you know, the, the, the perceptions and the viewpoints uh, that you picked out of the movies, the things that I didn't catch at all, the things that I totally missed went right over my head. You guys always do a great job, and I love these conversations. Uh, so thank you again for joining us tonight, and uh, we'll see you next time.